Welcome to Understanding the Basics of Agricultural Cooperatives. If you are unfamiliar with us or our center, um, we are the Center for Agricultural and Shale Law. And my name is Audrey Thompson. I'm a new staff attorney with the center here. And we just wanted to quickly show you some of the resources that we have available with our center on our website. We provide numerous resources for agricultural and shale legal and rural communities and stakeholders through our website. Um, this is our beginning here where we showcase our Agricultural Law Weekly Review and our Shale Law Weekly Reviews. These are both available for subscription up at the top. Another resource on our website is our topical resources where you can search by topic with our Shale Law, our Agricultural Law Virtual Resource Rooms. These are compiled resources on a single topic um, where you can see case law and statutes and relevant publications on a single topic. We also have our issue trackers, which are similar topical resources. The difference here is that these are temporal in nature. That's usually a timeline of events. So if you're looking for a particular development, these issue trackers are great. We also have our podcasts and our YouTube channel where this YouTube channel, this is where this webinar will be posted later. And finally, we also offer mediation services. We, the center operates the Pennsylvania Agricultural Mediation Program, which is funded through the USDA. This program has historically facilitated mediations between ag producers and the USDA, but the authorization for this program has been expanded over the years, and we can now offer uh, we can mediate on a broader range of issues. Jackie Schweikler is our program coordinator here. So please feel free to contact Jackie with any uh, questions about ag mediation. All right, so oops, we'll go here. So today's webinar on agricultural cooperatives is part of the center's understanding agricultural law series. Um, this is a course design of webinars designed to provide subject matter literacy and competence on fundamental issues of ag law to attorneys and business advisors who work with or represent agricultural or rural clients, but who may not specialize in the area of agricultural law. This series is wholly sponsored by Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's Ag Business Development Center, which was established the 2019 Farm Bill. The Ag Business Development Center aims to enhance the long-term vitality of Pennsylvania farms by supporting farm transitions, both from generation to generation and from conventional to organic farming, supporting beginning farmers, providing risk management education, and providing financial assistance through low-interest loans and grants. This is the fifth webinar in the Understanding Agricultural Law series. Previous topics include ag labor laws, farmland leasing for energy development, land use regulation for ag, and legal protections for ag operations. If you missed any of these webinars, all of these are available on our YouTube site. We do have more upcoming webinars in this Understanding the Basics of Ag Law series, so mark your calendars for Friday, September 23rd for livestock market regulation, and Friday, October 21st for crop insurance. The center also has several other upcoming webinars, which are part of different topical series that we offer. These may be a little more narrow or advanced in subject matter, um, but we do have several upcoming webinars under our quarterly dairy legal update series and our legal planning for specialty crop producers. More information and registration for all of these webinars is available on our website under events. And finally, before I turn this webinar over to Ross Pfeiffer, just a couple of reminders. This webinar will be recorded and is being recorded right now. Please use the Q&A feature for questions. All right. I will now turn this presentation over to Ross Pfeiffer to explain the basics of agricultural cooperatives. Ross Pfeiffer serves as director for Penn State's Center for Agricultural and Shale Law and Penn State's Rural Economic Development Clinic and is a clinical professor of law at Penn State Law where he teaches property law and oil and gas law. Ross, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Audrey. And Audrey is uh, a, a, our newest staff member, sort of. Um, Audrey worked 
as a research assistant for the center while she was going to, uh, to law school. And Audrey uh, graduated this spring and uh, just started as a staff attorney with the center on Monday. So this is what your uh, what, fifth, fifth day on a job for us as a, as a staff attorney. So welcome, welcome, Audrey. Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about about cooperatives and, and provide kind of the an introduction to the to the basics of cooperatives. I think the the description that we provided was a, a little ambitious in in terms of um, in, in terms of coverage. Now, what we're trying to do with this um, understanding agricultural law webinar series is at least at the at the outset cover a number of different topics, kind of and providing an overview of of those topics. As we move through this monthly series, we, we want to start drilling down a little bit deeper into some topics as well. And so we, we would welcome feedback that, uh, that, that you would have on topics that you, that you want to see us to, to drill a little bit deeper on. So, you know, for instance, um, you know, I'm not going to talk much about subchapter T today, um, other than mentioning it now and, 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 and a sentence or two at, at the end. But if, uh, if uh, you say, you know, I really would like to learn more about subchapter T, then we can, um, you know, we can schedule a program in the future where either if it's, um, uh, you know, where the center attorneys or, or for a topic like subchapter T, we likely would, would look for someone uh, at, at the national level who has, who has expertise on that. So please, please give us feedback on what you would like to see in, in later, um, later sessions. Okay, so, um, so what we are going to cover today, I'm going to talk a little bit about cooperatives generally. Then we're going to spend time talking about the two, two major statutes that really are the, um, you know, provide kind of the, the, the foundation for, uh, for, for, for cooperatives. And then just, just touch briefly on some, uh, some, some current issues. So with those statutes, we'll talk about, about uh, the statutes, talk about a few, a few cases that uh, in, interpret those, the, those statutes. Okay, so what's 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 a cooperative? Um, uh, you know, you see some some familiar names here. Often, um, you know, these the cooperatives for for people who don't know about cooperatives, they may they may not recognize that some of these some of these entities are are actually cooperatives. I mean, cooperatives can be formed as a way of of community development. Uh, cooperatives can be used as a way of, of uh, for, for promotion. I'm, I'm thinking of that Florida's, or Florida Natural um, Orange Juice commercial that, that was on a number of years ago where you, where when you reach into the, uh, the refrigerator or the, um, the refrigerator cabinet at the grocery store, the someone is on the on the orange uh, grove handing you orange juice and they're they're kind of using the the fact that they are a cooperative that they are farmers that that own that uh, that company as a, as a way of of marketing that uh, that that company so um you know certainly you're w w with a cooperative i mean it's it's a business form and you know you're all familiar with kind of the three basic types of of uh, business organizations the sole proprietorship partnership Corporation, um, a number of other business entity types um, can be authorized under under state states uh, state statutes like the LLCs, LLPs, and and cooperatives would uh, would would fall in line there as well. And e each of these business types has differences with regard to the ownership, control, financing. Um, when you when you look specifically at, uh, at at cooperatives and and I know we have some people from outside Pennsylvania but most of our audience is, is from Pennsylvania so um, looking at at Pennsylvania statutes you know this this is where you find the uh, the statutes that that are going to uh, to authorize and and govern the uh, the operations of, uh, of of cooperatives in in Pennsylvania so just cooperatives generally, as well as electric cooperatives, and then then specifically um, ag agricultural cooperatives. So they're all in in Title 15 of the uh, uh, consolidated statutes in the with the chapters in the in in the uh, the 70s. Okay, so uh, you know when you when you look at, at at cooperatives, there is this this the core principle that that really is behind the operation of of a cooperatives is this this collective action. And the benefits of collective action. So, with a with a corporation, you know that the, all of the operations of a of a traditional corporation are focused on providing profit for the shareholders of that corporation. And those shareholders are are not 
the necessarily the people who are who are using that cooperative, uh, excuse me, who are using that 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 corporation. With a cooperative, I mean the the core principle is that the there's there's collective action. There are benefits to to that collective action, so that the individuals or the individual businesses are are coming together to to purchase products, to to sell or market products, or or to receive ser services like insurance or or uh, or other services, and and they receive some benefit by working together to uh, for for that for that purpose. Uh, when you when you look at at cooperatives in the in in the ag um, industry, I mean cooperatives really play, uh, you know, I think an outsized role in the ag industry in in relation to cooperatives in any other in any other sector. And my 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 data is is a little bit out might be a little bit outdated here, but um, you know from from 1970 through the through the the the, uh, the mid 90s this this is the percentage of uh, of of output um, that was marketed through through cooperatives and this um, you know milk this is this is a relatively recent recent uh, statistic here that that about 85 percent of uh, of milk in the U.S. is marketed through through cooperatives. So you know, it's, it's certainly a, a significant way that farmers are marketing their products is through cooperatives, and and that's going to vary somewhat sector to sector or commodity to commodity. With with dairy being the commodity that that most heavily relies upon um, um, output being marketed through through cooperatives. When you look at the at the inputs, you know again a pretty pretty substantial amount of inputs are purchased through through cooperatives. And then when you look at at rural communities or agricultural and rural communities, cooperatives play a big part in in finance. You know the farm credit service is is a uh, a cooperative or a series of cooperatives, and rural um, rural electric or or other utilities in 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 rural areas are are often um, uh, provided by by a cooperative. Okay, so we just want to run through some the next the next few slides to show some some statistics to again kind of paint a picture of what the role of uh, of cooperatives is in the uh, in in the ag sector. And so here you can see that the number of cooperatives and and broken down by um, by by commodity and you can see the number of members that are that are within those um, th those commodities so you know you can see grains and oil seeds you know very large looks like that's the largest um, sector in terms of of um, cooperatives as well as well as um, as members um, you know again I mentioned mentioned dairy you know cotton seed is high fruits and vegetables are are high um, a, as well, and and then also this shows you the total number of uh, of, of cooperatives broken down, and I'll, I'll I'll touch on this a little bit later. Broken down by whether they're a marketing supplier or or, or service. Okay, now it, as far as so size of cooperatives, I mean cooperatives um, can be very large. Cooperatives cooperatives can also be rel relatively small. So you can see based on sales. Um, the the number of uh, of of cooperatives that uh, that fall within that that that's that sales category. So, um, you know, when you look at, at at small cooperatives, I mean, that can be organizing as a cooperative, really can be essential for for small uh, small producers to, uh, to to capture the market. So, you know, if you have like artisan cheese producers, they may they may not really be able to access the market. Um, and unless they, they they come together and, and organize through a, through a cooperative, um, uh, several years ago, a number of uh, of turkey producers in Virginia, I believe they lost they lost their, uh, um, their the contracts that they had with an integrator, and so so they decided to to form a cooperative, and, and you have the Virginia Poultry Growers uh, Cooperative that uh, that that exists today, which was you know farmers kind of starting somewhat from scratch. And using this uh, this business model as a um, as a way to uh, to 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 market their products, um, you know. But for the the collective action, the, these farmers would not have been able to market their product. There's a there's a, a an interesting documentary from uh, 2014, and it was called uh, Grazers: A Cooperative Story, and it was 
following the the startup of a of a, of a cooperative called um, Adirondack uh, Grazers, and this was a, 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 a um, I think it started with eight beef producers in in uh, central New York State. And it kind of walks through their kind of their journey. Now, I just checked the website and, and I got a, a dead link. So perhaps that's not a, a, a good, uh, um, maybe the, the, the end result uh, wasn't a, a successful, but I think it, 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 it shows kind of the issues that they had to, uh, to deal with. And really that cooperative model was, was the only way that they were gonna be able to, uh, um, to, to capture them, the, uh, to market their products. Okay, this, this is looking at Pennsylvania's, uh, some data from, from Pennsylvania in, in terms of the, um, the amount of uh, sales by commodity that's, that's marketed through cooperatives. So you can see milk um, and, and, and fruits and vegetables, you know, I think this would be um, apples and grapes that, um, that, that would be marketed through others as well, but I think those would be the dominant um, uh, in the fruit and vegetable category. Um, and you can see the total number of cooperatives here at the uh, at at the bottom of uh, of, of 41, uh, the number of agricultural uh, cooperatives. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about the his the history of, uh, of of cooperatives and and co agricultural cooperatives date back to the early 1800s. Uh, this Rochdale Society of Equitable Pioneers, they're viewed as as really being the um, kind of the original modern cooperative. They were they were started in England in, in 1844. There were there were 28 weavers who were experiencing hard times uh, due to the Industrial Revolution. So these weavers kind of got together. Each contributed a pound for the initial capital, and then they opened a store to sell butter, flour, oatmeal. Um, kind of staples that they would not have been able to afford, but for um, kind of coming together and, and essentially buying those products in a, um, you know, taking advantage of the economies of scale in, uh, in the purchase of those, of those products. So the, these, these Rochdale Society really, they, they established the, the framework that, uh, of cooperative principles that, that still exist today. Now, specifically, this is what their goal was, to sell provisions at the store, so that they, their, their, their members could purchase homes, manufacture goods their members need, and, and, and their members work there. So it was both providing employment as well. Now, when you look at, at, at the uh, kind of the principles of operation, um, you know, you'll see a lot of things that are, you know, very familiar today, almost, almost 200 years later, that you have this open democratic uh, or open membership with democratic voting, the equities provided by the members, not by outside uh, outside individuals or entities. Uh, there was limited equity ownership by by individual members, and then that that income is is distributed back or through to the members on a, on a patronage basis. So on the on the based upon the amount that they are using that that store to to purchase purchase items, and then limited equity dividends. So you know not like a um, a, a, a traditional, a traditional stock um, like you would have with a traditional corporation. Okay, now, now there, they also had other, other uh, principles that that get into more of you know kind of some of the uh, social, social issues as well. You know, a duty to to educate, uh, political and religious neutrality, equality in in uh, in in membership. So this this Rochdale Society again really is kind of the viewed as the original modern um, mo modern cooperative. Um, now, when we look at kind of the principles today, we have these 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 three um, user principles: a user owner, user control, user benefits, and you know the user owner simply the the the, per the people who use the cooper cooperative. Are the people who own the cooperative, or or flip that around? Those who own it are the ones who use it. Those who control it are the ones who use it. Um, those who benefit from it are the ones who who use it. So it 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 they all um, circle back to the to the user of the cooperative or to the to the members of the cooperative. That everything that the cooperative does circles back to those to those members. Okay, um, the types of types of cooperatives. 
Um, I, I referenced this in uh, with, with some of the data. You have purchasing cooperatives based on kind of this ec economies of scale. And, and so, you know, with the Rochdale uh, pioneers, you know, they were able to buy um, the supplies or the, the staples that they needed because they were taking advantage of the of the economies of, of, of scale. Now, with the purchasing cooperative, you're going you're going to have some kind of a, the, the mechanism to to provide that that refund that back to the uh, um, uh, back to the to the members. So it, the members are purchasing, you know, whatever they're purchasing, if it's flour and sugar or or tractor tires and, and, and milk replacer, they're purchasing those, those supplies at cost. At the end of the day, they're gonna purchase them at cost. Now, when they go into the store, a price is gonna be established, with, which doesn't necessarily represent what the cost, what will ultimately be. But this, this patronage refund is a way of um, kind of settling that up. So, um, uh, so that 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 the members are ultimately uh, purchase, essentially purchasing things at, at cost. Now, with a, with a marketing cooperative, the 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 individual farmers are coming together to sell or to market their their product. And so, similarly, um, at the end of the day, all of the proceeds from the sale of that of that product are going to to uh, um, be be provided to to the members, but there's going to have to be some mechanism um, that that uh, provides for a payment to the farmers when uh, when the commodity is is transferred to the cooperative, and then uh, you know to the extent that they're or or to address um, um, revenue that would be realized in addition to that, there's going to be some mechanism to provide that. Uh, that revenue to the uh, to the farmer, so that the farmer is ultimately receiving all of the revenue from the uh, from from the sale of that uh, of of that uh, commodity, and then services. Um, you know the idea that uh, that that individuals are going to receive those services for less when they when they work together, and again at at the end of the day, those those um, the the members of that co-op are going to receive those services for. For what the what the the true cost of those services uh, was. So now let's let's talk about antitrust. So you know why are antitrust issues um, or concerns present with with cooperatives? Well, you know generally speaking, um, our, our legal system doesn't look favorably upon different business entities in the same industry or business competitors um, acting collectively. So you know if Ford and GM started to Kind of get together to uh, to make pricing decisions or other marketing decisions. There would be a uh, a problem with the with the Department of Justice. Cooperatives, however, are are treated differently. And you know, we we, we often, I guess, just to take a step back. I mean, we often don't think of you know farmer A and farmer B who has a dairy farm just just down the just down the road as as being business competitors. But th but they are. I mean, they're all they're all trying to uh, to produce the uh, the commodity as uh, efficiently efficiently as as they can relative to uh, uh, to to one another so uh, so we have these anti antitrust concerns and just kind of going back in through some of the the history of, of legislation um, there you know in the in the late 1800s there there were concerns about monopolistic behavior and so Congress started to regulate monopolistic behavior uh, Congress enacted the the, uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890, and that act criminalized um, business acts that restrain trade or conspiracies to, uh, to do that. Now, there was no um, exception or, or, or carve out for, for cooperatives. And as a result, there were um, numerous indictments of, of cooperative leaders. And you know, at that time, there were, there, there were a significant um, number of ag cooperatives, about a thousand ag cooperatives existed at that time in the dairy industry and in the in the grain industry and 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 fruits and vegetables. I mean, somewhat, you know, a hundred plus years later, the same the same commodities that that really rely a lot that that uh, the commodities that rely on cooperatives today relied on them at at that time as well. So, as a result of of these um, farmers and agricultural cooperatives. Kind of running afoul of the of, of the Sherman Act, there there was a thought that that they needed that farmers needed to have uh, some protection, and so the, the the Clayton Act 
was passed in 1914 um, to try to permit these, these agricultural associations. But the, the, really the protections weren't, weren't strong enough, didn't go far enough. Um, it, it didn't cover um, organizations that had capital stock or that were conducted for profit, um, which you know, is a pretty, pretty um, um, glaring omission. Um, and so the Clayton Act really just didn't um, provide the protection. And so then we had Capper Volstead that was enacted in 1922. And this is the act that really, um, you know, but for this act, cooperatives could not, could not exist. And so it's been referred to as, you know, Magna Carta of cooperatives, a cooperative bill of rights, you know, pretty strong language, but again, it, it, is the essential provides the essential protection, um, or else all cooperatives would would um, have issues with the with the uh, with the Sherman Act. It's a it's a pretty simple um, statute, um, two two sections, and it provides a an antitrust exemption. It's it's a limited exemption to an association of producers. So it it, it basically it's protecting these farmers, or it's designed to protect farmers from from the inherent unequal bargaining power in dealing with, with corporations. It protects consumers from, from market uh, disruptions. And it, it essentially lets a cooperative act as one farmer. So there's no antitrust problem if we, if we view the cooperative as, as an individual farmer. And that's essentially what, what Capper Volstead um, how it allows cooperatives is it considers that association of farmers to be one one farmer. So, um, you know, if we look at um, who is uh, who is protected, what what activities are are protected? Those are really really key uh, key questions. And um, you know, is in and, and, and th this is the first or or, or part of the uh, the first section of Capper Volstead. And, and you can see that it's it's protecting persons engaged in the production of agricultural products as farmers, planters, ranchmen, dairymen, nut or fruit growers. So, you know, it's somewhat broad, but it still is limiting it to people that are that are engaged in production as farmers. Now it allows them to act together with or without capital stocks, so that addresses the, the, the Clayton Act uh, problem. So they can collectively process, prepare for market handle or market, um, mark, market the products. Now, there, there also um, is a requirement in, in Capper Volstead that, that the association has to be operated for the mutual benefit of the members. Um, also, the association can't have more non-member business then it does member business. And so that goes into the, you know, back to kind of that user benefit that, you know, the cooperative is designed for the, to be used by the cooperative members. And, you know, this is, this requirement is built into, uh, <clears throat> built into Capra Volstead. And then also um, requ requirements, and this is an or between them. So you either, um, um, have to allow kind of one member one vote or you can't pay more than div you can't pay dividends more than eight percent per year again that's an or so so a cooperative doesn't have to be set up with one member one vote but if it if it does allow for members to vote um, based upon the the amount of, of shares they have then the dividends are going to be limited to uh, to eight percent. Okay, the second section of, of Capper Volstead. So, you know, the first one provides that, you know, a cooperative is basically um, like one, one farmer. It provides who, what cooperatives are going to uh, receive that pr protection. But the second section provides that this cooperative can't engage in monopolistic behavior. So, you know, the cooperative can't can't restrain uh, re restrain um, trade to the extent that that the price of an ag product is unduly enhanced. So you know so if you have Ocean Spray, a, 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 an agricultural cooperative, the the individual growers of cranberries um, they're protected in the the actions that that they are taking. Um, but when when you know after the Ocean Spray 
produces the product or, or, or has the commodities, ocean spray can't engage in monopolistic, monopolistic behavior. Okay, so that, that is, uh, you know, and, and this has, I guess, just in terms of application today, you know, as we look at a lot of the merger activity that, that has taken place, I mean, this, this you know, part of, of Capra Volstead provides that that, that, that that cooperative is not provided protection if, if it is engaging in monopolistic uh, behavior. Okay, so look, look at uh, some case law, a, uh, a Supreme Court case uh, uh, case Svein versus uh, Sunkist in 1967, and and this addressed kind of um, the requirements for a cooperative uh, in terms of the individual members of that cooperative in order for the cooperative to be um, eligible for protection under under Capra Volstead. So, um, in in this case, um, there was a uh, Sunkist, you know, a comp cooperative that uh, you know people are familiar with today. Uh, so the, the membership of, of Sunkist, there were, there were orange growers, and there also were some, some packing houses that, um, that, that were for-profit. They were not, uh, they, they, they didn't own orange groves. They were not uh, producing um, oranges, uh, but they were part of this, uh, of, of the Sunkist cooperative. So the, um, there was an investor-owned citrus processor or, or multiple uh, processor, processors that challenged Sunkist, um, you know, Sunkist had a large market position and these other citrus processors were saying that, uh, that, that Sunkist was not an eligible cooperative because of the inclusion of these, of these packing houses. And therefore they, they did not, um, were not entitled to the, the Capra Volstead protection from, uh, uh, from, from the Sherman antitrust, um, provisions. Okay, so the, um, the Supreme Court, the ruling here was that, that, that the cooperative must be com composed solely of agricultural producers. So the fact that these packing houses, and again, go, going back to the, to the, uh, to the definition of, uh, of, of or who is entitled to protect protection, it is persons engaged in the production of agricultural products as farmers, planters, ranchers, dairymen. And so when you look at these, these packing houses, they, they did not fit that requirement. So they were not eligible for, for, uh, from Capra Volstead protection. And as a result, every single member of that, of that association um, was, was removed from the Capra Volstead, uh, Capra Volstead protection. So, um, you know, extremely critical that a cooperative, every single member of that cooperative needs to um, meet that, that eligibility requirement in, in the first section of, of, uh, of Capra Volstead. Now, this, this case did, did raise the question of who is considered to, uh, to, to, to be um, an agricultural producer. Um, you know, the packing houses clearly were not. But we're, in a couple minutes, we're going to talk about another case where um, there, there was some question as to whether or the issue that the court looked at was whether a particular member was a, um, what was a producer. The issue addressed by this case was um, th that, that every, every member needed to meet the eligibility requirements. Okay, a, a more recent um, case on, on really that, that same... Uh, uh, generally, that that same point. Um, this this was a mushroom antitrust litigation. You know, long lasting litigation. There was a um, kind of a related case that or a related opinion that was issued, I think, earlier this year in this same uh, this um, in, in the mushroom antitrust litigation. But this this particular um, court opinion was um, addressing that eligibility requirement and the the facts here. We had um, um, EMMC was a uh, was a was a large mushroom co-op, and it, it had it had growers, packagers, sellers, distributors um, that were that were all members. The plaintiffs that um, initiated this uh, the litigation were were direct purchasers of of, of mushrooms, and the uh, the allegation for in the litigation was that. That there was a, um, a scheme, com, uh, conspiracy to to cause those direct purchasers of mushrooms to pay 
artif artificially inflated prices for the for the mushrooms. Now, EMMC's response to the complaint was they were an agricultural cooperative. They were um, entitled to protection under under Capra Volstead, which which provides the, uh, the that antitrust um, exemption. Okay, so the court um, the court once again looked at that uh, kind of a related issue to to that in the in the case vein as to um, was every single member of the cooperative entitled to to that protection? And there was there was one member um, N um, Couton who was not a, um, a, a, a farmer. Um, it was, they, they were, that entity was, was, just a, uh, was, was just a processor and it was undisputed that that entity was just a processor. Now, the, the issue here is that um, the, the individuals who had an ownership interest in Encatone were exactly the same as the individuals who had an ownership in M&V, which clearly was um, uh, entitled to uh, to Capper Volstead protection. So the uh, the argument or the, the 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 allegations were that that M Cutone had been wrongly registered, that it that it uh, that it should have been um, should have been M and V. Um, and so the argument was that this um, you know M Cutone being being a member that was just a de minimis violation, and uh, and and it shouldn't have been enough of a violation to remove Capra Volstead protection from that, from that cooperative. Uh, the court, however, um, did not accept that argument, found it was not a de minimis violation, looked at, at M. Catone and, and uh, M. Catone um, was exactly the, you know, the, the proverbial middleman that was um, exactly the entity against whom Capra Volstead was, was trying to protect farmers. So, um, M. Catone had the ability to participate in decision making of the co-op of the cooperative, and uh, and and they they were not eligible, so this cooperative was was not entitled to uh, to Capra Volstead protection. So, um, you know, I guess the, the the bottom line of these cases, I mean, obviously every member has to meet the requirements, but it illustrates that that um, you know the the Capra Volstead was to protect was to protect the farmers. And if you if you have members who are who are not farmers who don't meet that requirement, then um, you're not uh, you're not accomplishing um, you know giving them protection wouldn't wouldn't accomplish the, the goals of the of the statute. Okay, so the um, the, the next issue we'll we'll talk about what is a farmer or, or what what is necessary um, for someone to be considered a farmer. Um, and so the uh, the cooperative here, and this is another Supreme Court case from 1978, but the, the cooperative here was National Broiler Marketing Association. It was comprised of about 75 entities who were kind of the, the traditional um, poultry integrators that, that, uh, that, that you would think about. The, uh, you know, the integrators who um, have processing plants, who contract with independent uh, farmers, uh, the farmers um, own the land. The, the chickens are provided by the integrator to the farmer. The farmer raises those chickens, and then the integrator comes and, and, uh, and, and picks the, them up. So that, that's you know, the, ba the basic fact pattern of, of, uh, of who, who these, these entities, uh, who the members were. Now, you know, in, when you look at this you know, kind of the poultry industry, some of these integrators, they may have their own um, Barns where they're where they're raising chickens. They may have a uh, um, a, a breeding facility uh, or hatchery, so they may have facilities where they actually um, are engaged in in raising the, the the chickens at different stages, as well as um, contracting out to individual farmers to, uh, to to raise the broilers. So so this this uh, this this cooperative MBN, NBMA. Um, they um, uh, DOJ brought a, an action against them for, for violating the Sherman Act because not all of the members were um, were qualified for Capra Volstead protection. Um, 
then then the cooperative obviously um, Ray says a defense that uh, that 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 they were entitled to this protection under under Capper Volstead. Okay, so the uh, the court again looked at the purpose of the of Capper Volstead that it was to 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 focus on the um, the market strengths of, of farmers. It 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 looked at kind of the the legislative history that um, that that farmers were perceived to be in a in a particularly harsh um, economic position. Uh, they, they were subject to kind of the vagaries of the of the ag markets, and they also, um, you know, did not have the, the leverage in dealing with uh, with with cooperatives, um, and that Congress did not intend to provide benefits to to processors and 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 packers. So, you know, the question here: Were those integrators farmers? And the the answer to that question, according according to the uh, the, the Supreme Court, was um, that in order to be a farmer, they needed to be raising the, the the poultry. And so, if if the integrator had a breeder flock or had a hatchery, then they were you know, or the, or they had a facility where they were raising the broilers themselves, then they were considered to be a farmer and they were entitled to cap or Volstead. But if you had a, a, an integrator who did not have any facilities where they were actually raising poultry, then they were not considered to be a farmer. They were not entitled to receive the, uh, the, the cap or Volstead uh, pr protection. So, um, you know, and then again, only having one that is not, um, a, meet the, that does not meet the requirements um, as, as being a farmer then removes the uh, capra Volstead protection from the entire cooperative. Now there was a, a pretty vigorous dissent in, in that case um, that was uh, uh, positing that this was essentially tying antitrust liability to land ownership um, by saying that if the integrator owned land and had chickens on it, then they were entitled to antitrust protection. But if they didn't own and the, the the land where there were where there were chickens being raised, then they were um, they 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 did not have that antitrust protection. Okay, um, shifting gears now to the uh, the second statute that I want to talk about today, and this is the the Agricultural Fair Practices Act. And just uh, some some background here: um, there was um, you know in the 1950s and 60s there were some companies that were. Um, refusing to deal with farmers who are a member of, uh, of, of a cooperative. Um, some thoughts, you know, among these, uh, these, these handlers that uh, um, they, they didn't want to um, enable this, this collective negotiation, uh, belief that it, was, that it was resulting in higher prices. And so uh, Congress enacted the Ag Fair Practices Act uh, to prevent retaliation against, uh, against handlers. Okay, this is the uh, the, the policy or um, the purpose section for this for this um, statute, um, and I'll just kind of read. I, I guess starting about midway um, midway through this this paragraph, the, the sentence starting with with because, um, you know, really talks about the um, again that adverse bargaining position that uh, that that farmers are in. Uh, with regard to agricultural commodities. So it, it reads, because agricultural products are produced by numerous individual farmers, the marketing and bargaining position of individual farmers will be adversely affected unless they are free to join together voluntarily in cooperative organizations as authorized by, by law. Okay, so this, um, you know, the crux of this, and, I, and I'll get to this in a couple slides, is, is really establishing standards of fair practices. And these these fair practices are are imposed upon upon handlers and and you know the term handler is is I, I think somewhat uniquely used in in agriculture or in in some um, in some instances in in agriculture and it, it basically is that 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 first purchaser of the of the product so if you um, look at, at at traditionally how agricultural commodities are are produced and marketed where they're they're raised on and the farm, then they're sold to some processor who then sells them to you know that that product to, to someone else before it reaches the the consumer. I mean that that handler is 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 basically that that processor. Now obviously it's not you know the, the chain is not often you know can differ from that. So 
So that's maybe an oversimplification. But this, these, the Ag Fair Practices Act is 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 putting or imposing requirements upon these handlers, and and this is where it's uh, it's defining um, who those handlers are. And I think the thought at at that time, at the time that this was enacted, the thought was that the handlers are really the people who had the power. The farmers were really powerless unless they banded together. Now, I think you could look at our food system today and say maybe the handlers don't have um, the dominant power. Um, you know, retailers or or rest or chain restaurants have have a lot of power, um, but this this uh, statute was designed really to uh, impose those obligations upon upon handlers. And here is, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, the, the crux of of the Ag Fair Practices Act is is in these um, these these standards and you know so what it prevents a handler from doing is to um, relating to the membership of co-ops so a, a handler can't coerce a member in exercising their their right to join or not join a, uh, a cooperative they also can't refuse to deal with with someone um, because because of that person's membership in in a co-op. On B, they can't um, they can't discriminate against the producer, so they can't say you know we are paying uh, this is our price that we pay to producers who are not members of co-op, and this lesser price is what we pay to uh, to members who who are cooperative members. So you can't discriminate. In you know, in any respect, in terms of uh, of that acquisition of the um, of of the products, um, you you can't coerce or intimidate a farmer to um, uh, to, to terminate their contract um, or to terminate their membership agreement with a uh, with with a co-op. Um, you can't provide um, incentives or or uh, or bribe uh, bribery. Um, as a, a way of uh, convincing people um, or influencing their membership, their cooperative membership decision, you can't make false reports about the uh, about the, uh, the the cooperative. And now this says of, co of producers or handlers, so it does. There is it, there is a two way street here, um, and and then you can't conspire with uh, with others. Uh, to do to do any of these violations. So you know this is how it 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 protects the rights of individual farmers to take advantage of the benefits that they that they would receive through being a, a member of the uh, of the co-op. Okay, now the um, the statute it, it does provide um, what's referred to as a as a disclaimer, and you know this disclaimer. You know, the first part of it is saying, you know, um, companies you can't, or handlers, you can't um, influence or you can't treat people adversely because of, because of the cooperative. But this section is saying, handlers, you don't have to deal with cooperatives. You can't be forced to, uh, to, de to deal with, uh, with, with cooperatives. So, you know, it somewhat softens the, those pro prohibited practices. Um, and it doesn't prohibit a, a handler from, from refusing to deal with a, with a co-op member unrelated to their, to their co-op to their membership in the co-op. So if, if a handler says, well, we don't pick up milk in Township X, well, the fact that the dairy producer, maybe the only dairy producer in Township X is a cooperative member you know th th that that's fine. That doesn't prohibit the uh, uh, the handler from refusing to deal with that customer on a basis other than their membership in that in that co-op. Now, I mean, you can see some problem potential problems with that, um, but handlers they can use that uh, that reasonable uh, you know a, a reasonable basis to re to refuse to uh, to deal with that that co-op member as long as it is not because of the, uh, the farmer's uh, cooperative membership. And the handler also can, can refuse to deal with the, with the co-op itself. So the fact that someone, that a farmer is a cooperative, cooperative uh, member 
doesn't mean that the uh, that the handler has to deal with the co-op. They can't be compelled to deal with the co-op. And so that kind of, you know, the duality of the of of those, um, you know, the prohibited practices with with this disclaimer, it um, there's a case that kind of highlights the kind of the issues that are that are presented in it's a uh, butts versus loss and milk. So this was a a um, uh, a district, federal district court case from from 1970, and and this was a lawsuit that was initiated by USDA against Lawson Milk, who was a was a, an independent milk dealer who had terminated a contract with the dairy farmer allegedly because of the farmer's membership in the in the co-op. So they, this is this is kind of a timeline of the uh, the, the the relevant uh, relevant facts here, and. Um, um, the, the facts here. So we have um, we have we we're as the dairy farmer, and and we're signed a, um, a a marketing agreement with with Lawson. Um, you know, had had followed through with that with that agreement for for a long period of time, and then um, in 1969, then we're entered into an agreement with the co-op. Okay, um, the co-op or after we were entered into that agreement, and, and that agreement provided that the co-op was, was the sole and exclusive agent to, to sell all milk and cream produced on the farm. Okay, so then you know, a couple of weeks later, um, the farmer sends a letter to, to the milk dealer, and, and in that letter um, authorizes um, that the deduction be paid to the co-op. So you know, Weir is authorizing that the money that that the farmer agreed to, uh, you know, to to provide to to the co-op, it's authorizing that that deduction come out of the milk check and be and be paid to the cooperative. Um, but the farmer also said they had no intention of terminating that contract with with Lawson. So so Lawson got that contract uh, or got that letter and and responded by terminating the contract, saying that. Um, that the contract that um, um, that by signing the contract with uh, with the cooperative that that was um, essentially compelling the cooperative or excuse me compelling Lawson to deal with that cooperative for for one customer. So they said we you know quoted we do not quarrel with your with your joining um, the cooperative, but you know, and now I'm, I'm paraphrasing that that we're not required to deal with the co-op, and we're not going to um, to to deal with the co-op. Therefore, we're terminating our contract, and gave them the uh, a date uh, upon which they were no longer going to uh, uh, to to accept milk. Okay, so um, the the cooperative it subsequently sent, or I guess not subsequently, but a letter kind of crossed in the mail where the uh, the cooperative sent a letter to Lawson, but. You know, Lawson had sent that letter to Weir, terminating terminating the contract. Um, subsequently, then Weir filed a complaint with USDA with USDA, and uh, and USDA took action against Lawson. And the and the issue really was whether Lawson had violated the Ag Fair Practices Act by terminating that marketing agreement um, upon being notified that Weir had signed the the, uh, the contract with uh, with with the co-op. Lawson argued, you know, that, that the Ag Fair Practices Act doesn't compel them to uh, to deal with the co-op, and they would have been compelled to deal with the co-op if they if they had not terminated the the agreement. the uh, The court um, did not agree. The court basically said that Lawson acted prematurely, that um, they that they should have given Lawson the ability to continue to deal, or they should have given the farmer the ability to deal with Lawson even after they um, be became a cooperative member. So you know even though the farmer told Lawson to deduct them the uh, to deduct the money, um, the court felt that that did not provide a basis for Lawson to to terminate that contract. So you know I think this it, it's an old case, but it but it kind of presents the the issue. And of of you know what is a, a a handler to do when when someone that they're dealing with 
uh, join, joins a cooperative. And I think the, the, that, that handler has to make sure that the, uh, that, that the farmer has the ability to continue to deal with them, um, even though they are to continue to deal with the handler, even though the farmer is a, is a member of the co-op, while also saying that the, that the handler is not required to deal with the co-op. So, you know, I think what, what Lawson should have done was to say to, uh, to the farmer, um, we're going to give you your milk check. You can provide the, uh, the payments to, uh, to the co-op, but we're giving you your milk check. Okay, so um, current issues have, okay, about just a couple minutes left. Um, I, I just cut and pasted this from the, the National Council of Farm Cooperatives, their priorities to try to get a kind of a flavor of what are, what are some of the current issues, at least from the cooperative standpoint. And, and you can see number one, um, you know, this, this hundred year old statute, um, it's their top legislative priority to make sure that those protections um, remain in place for, for uh, farmer cooperatives. Number two, the subchapter T uh, provisions, which, which provide um, for the exclusion of patronage, um, patronage refunds from the uh, cooperatives uh, income ta taxes. Um, third, focusing on the farm credit system, um, supporting that, which is obviously a, a large series of cooperatives and then focusing on, on cooperative uh, eligibility for, um, for federal programs and, and initiatives. Now, they had other initiatives, but the, or, or the uh, other legislative priorities, but the, these are really the ones that focused on, on cooperatives. Um, last slide, these slides are available on, uh, on our website, just providing some, uh, some resources of some places that you can go to get more information on co-ops. Okay, with that, I, I, um, I take some questions here. Um, uh, okay. Um, first question: Who brought the case against EMMC? It, this was it was brought by um, by retailers, and so so grocery stores. Um, the most recent opinion that I saw, I'm forgetting now what the grocery store was. They, they had opted out of that initial um, opinion, but it, it was brought by the grocery stores. Um, okay. So um, interested in regulations um, regarding establishment and cooperatives. Okay, in the US there are different regulations in different states. Okay, um, in, in, interested in information on re, in regulations in different states. Um, if you check the resources on this last slide, I'm also happy to, to, um, to provide information offline that, that we, can, we can discuss um, where, where to, to receive more information on uh, on some of the state the state requirements, um, how how do you assess the future of cooperatives? Uh, you know, cooperatives continue to be very strong, and and you know, as I mentioned, in some sectors, they are you know stronger than others, but in some sectors, they're really um, you know absolutely essential, just based on the 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 volume of uh, of the commodity that's that's being marketed through through them. Um, Okay, question, is it discrimination to restrict eligibility for board service? Um, board service of, I guess I'm not clear on, are we talking about cooperative board service? Um, if this is a reference to the Ag Fair Practices Act um, and the, the, um, the provision that handlers can't discriminate um, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to discriminate if, if they're looking at, at people serving on the boards of those companies, they, they would not be able to, um, you know, if, if they were, if there was a requirement that uh, cooperative members were not able to serve on the board, I, I would think that that would be um, treating them differently, although I would want to go back to the statute to see, um, because it does list a series of, um, you know, it talks about pricing, and, and purchasing, and so I, I would want to look to see is is board service or something related to board service included in that um, in that restriction in the Ag Fair Practices Act. Um, I guess the the, the last question um, would a handler um, within the meaning of the Ag Fair Practices Act include a transporter of agricultural products 
Um, for example, a railroad company or trucking company that moves products from, pl from place to place. Um, you know, again, I'll, I pulled the statute up, uh, up here and I just have to move the little boxes around on Zoom. Um, term handler means any person engaged in the, the business or practice of acquiring the, uh, the, 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 the products. And so, you know, I guess we're looking at what does it mean to acquire, acquire the product? Um, are they taking title to it or are they, or are they simply mo moving that, that product? Um, so I, I guess I'm not providing a clear answer there, but I think that's, that's, that's the issue is what, what's meant by that term acquiring in, in the statute. So I think I have gone um, a minute over. So um, you know, I'm happy to take any other questions that, that anyone has um, offline. Um, our next program is um, we're, we're talking about livestock markets. So we hope that you will join us uh, for, for that program. So thank you very much.